The Mahabharata tells how the demigod Karma was conceived and raised. Not yet married, his mother, Kunti, was visited by the sun god. This was followed by the birth of a father-like son. For he shone like the sun itself. Fearing the embarrassing idea of losing her virginity, Kunti puts the baby in a cage that she secretly takes to the river. A kind woman named Adarata saves the child and gives him the name Karma, then raises him as her own son. The resemblance to the story of Moses is obvious, we meet countless sons of gods. They are mixed with hundreds in myths, but they are also present in the official texts considered serious. Let's also focus on a story, which appears on one of the parchments discovered in 1947 on the shores of the Dead Sea and which dates from the 2nd century BC. Returning from a journey that had forced him to be away for more than nine months, Noah's father Lemech was amazed to find in his home a baby who could not be his own and who did not look like him. Lemach overwhelmed his wife with reproach, and she began to swear on all that was most precious to him. Oh my God, this seed is from you, this fruit is from you and not from a stranger, a guardian, or a son of heaven. But Lemech didn't believe a word. Very troubled, Lemech went to seek the advice of his father, Matusalem, who, after a careful thought, found no explanation for this birth. That is why Methuselah also went to consult his own father, the wise Enoch, who, after listening to him, sent him home telling him that divine justice would strike the earth and mankind, and that all beings would be destroyed because they are dirty and corrupt. Enoch added that he should ask Lemech to keep the baby and name it Noah. He also said that Noah had been chosen to become the patriarch of all that would live after the great judgment. This incident is truly amazing. First, because she repeatedly mentions the possibility that Noah's father was a son of heaven, then because it is said that Noah's parents had already been warned of the coming flood, and especially because Grandpa Matusalem had been informed by the same Enoch who, according to tradition, ascended to heaven in a chariot of fire shortly afterwards. If the church fathers had considered us adults, then they would have made room for the book of Enoch in the Bible. The fact that they stole this book from the public domain is reason enough to get to know Enoch and always return to him. After reading Enoch's message, you understand that the church had good reason to miss his book. Because we find in it information so explosive that it would have risked overturning from the pedestal the image of God that the old one offers us. Testament. So who was this Enoch whose name means initiate, enlightened, informed? Enoch is, according to Moses, the seventh of the ten patriarchs who lived before the flood. The son of Jerd. He was forgotten for thousands of years for the benefit of his own son Methuselah, who lived 969 years. After the first six books of the Bible, initiate Enoch lived 365 years before, not to die, but to ascend to heaven in a chariot of fire. Most modern scholars agree that the original text of the Book of Enoch was written in Hebrew or Armenian. This original text has been lost and has not been found to this day. However, the Ethiopians translated into Greek a version written in the early Christian era and discovered in Egypt. It is not known at what time this Book of Enoch was incorporated into the Bible for use in the Ethiopian church. If we stubbornly interpret the book of Enoch exclusively according to the method of theologians, we will actually find ourselves in front of a labyrinth of bizarre proportions, which no thread of Ariadne connects. On the other hand, if we neglect the picturesque blooms that beautify it so as to retain only the skeleton of this work, we discover a strangely dramatic message for a reader living in our day. Commentators on the Book of Enoch all agree that it is the work of a single author and that it was written during the last quarter of the 2nd century BC. Enoch's text illustrates in an exemplary way what we have already said about the difficulty of a narrator expressing something for which there are no words. The direct witness and the narrator are equally overwhelmed by the inexpressible situation because it is inconceivable. The only solution is to resort to comparisons. Therefore, the expression, something like, returns at every step, as is usually the case when it comes to describing an object, a phenomenon I have never noticed before the era in which it first appears. In the absence of precise and appropriate words, the observer, the narrator, 
gives free rein to a completely oriental fantasy by resorting to allegories. The first five chapters of the Book of Enoch announce a final judgment. God in heaven will leave his home and come to earth with his legions of angels. The next eleven chapters describe the fall of the apostate angels who were united with the daughters of men, thus violating the divine will. These angels have received from their God missions so precisely defined that it is quite difficult to see in them some militiamen of heaven. Semias teaches her enchantments and the art of cutting roots, Arniaro's exorcisms, Barachel the observation of the stars, Cocobel astrology, Ezekiel the science of clouds. Arakiel the signs of the earth, Sanyazavel the signs of the sun and the signs of the moon. You have the impression that the god of these angels has appointed true instructors. True specialists for tasks that awaited him on earth. These instructors were extremely competent, each in his own field. Having knowledge infinitely superior to the knowledge of the inhabitants of the earth at that time. Chapters 17, 36 represent the essential part of the book. They describe Enoch's journey to different worlds under distant celestial vaults. Chapters 37 LXXI relate very different parables, formulated by the gods for the prophet. Enoch was ordered to write down these messages so that they could be passed on to distant generations, as his contemporaries were unable to understand their technical aspect. So it was about messages for the future. This is not my personal interpretation, but exactly what is in the text. Chapters LXXII LXXXII contain detailed information about the course of the sun and the moon, about the days added, about the motion of the stars and the celestial mechanics. They specify geographical coordinates in the universe. The last chapters relate Enoch's conversations with his son, Methuselah, to whom he announced the flood. Finally, they recount the ascension of the prophet to heaven in a chariot of fire. The Slavic version of the Book of Enoch relates some events not mentioned in the Abyssinian text. We learn how the prophet came into contact with visitors from heaven. I was 365 when I was alone at home one day in the second month. Then I saw two very tall people, whom I had never seen on earth. Their faces shone like the sun, their eyes like burning torches, their mouths are burning, their clothes were extraordinary and their arms looked like golden wings. They sat at the head of my bed and called me by name. I awoke and rose to my feet, then bowed to them, pale with fear. Then the two men said to me, Don't be afraid, Enoch be fearless. The Lord has sent us to you. Today you must ascend to heaven with us. Tell your sons and your servants what to do in the house. But no one should go looking for you until the Lord brings you back to them. Religious commentators consistently state that the antediluvian patriarch had a vision in this case. The extreme precision of this text contradicts their interpretation. Enoch wakes up and, as his visitors have asked, tells his family what to do in his absence. Enoch's adventures were not written at random, but according to the express instructions given to him, the Lord says to me, O oh Enoch, look carefully at the writing of the heavenly tablets. Read what is written on him, and remember in detail. I looked at everything on the blackboards, I read everything that was written, I remembered, and I read the book. This is the complicated doctrine of wisdom, written by the scribe Enoch, and as it is to be praised by all men, as it is to be judged by all the earth. This is the book, the word of righteousness and the true doctrine of the eternal guards. And now, my son Matusalem, I will tell you everything and write it for you. I have revealed everything to you and handed you the books where all these things are written. Methuselah, my son, take care of the books written by your father's hand and pass them on to future generations on earth. Everything is so sober, deliberate, that the being who dictated it to him cannot be considered at all imaginary. No god has ever asked for a detailed description of his deeds. The Slavic version of the Book of Enoch tells us how many volumes were dictated to the prophet. She insists that they were not written after the dictation of the Lord in person, but after that of the archangel Bretel. And he described to me all the things in heaven, on earth, in the seas, the origins of all the elements, the course of the seasons, the days and the transformations, the requirements and the teachings.
And Brettel spoke to me for thirty days and thirty nights, his lips spoke again. And I was writing without stopping. By the time I finished, I had written three hundred and sixty books. The Book of Enoch frequently mentions the Eternal Guards. Before these events, Enoch was hidden, and none of the sons of men knew where he was hiding, where he was staying, or what was happening to him. And behold, the guard of the Holy One called me, the scribe of Enoch, and said to me, Enoch, the scribe of righteousness, go and tell the guards of heaven who have left the high heavens, the eternal and holy abode, they have corrupted the wives as the sons of men, who have taken their wives. It would be blasphemous to equate these heavenly guards with innocent angels. Their numbers were quite large, a total of two hundred, who gave birth to a thousand children. Two hundred guards on the expedition, without women, went in search of the object of their desire, as do all the soldiers in the occupied territories. They took wives, each of whom chose one and began to defile himself with her. They remained heavy and gave birth to giants three hundred cubits high. They went to the daughters of the people of the earth, slept with them, and defiled themselves with women. But the women gave birth to giants, and the whole earth was filled with blood and vengeance. If there were any doubts about the origin and nature of the guards, Enoch finally dispelled them by recounting the discourse of the Lord commanding their troops. Come here and listen to what I'm telling you. You will go to the guardians of heaven who sent you to me to intervene in their behalf, and you will tell them. You were to act as intermediaries for people, not people for you. Why have you forsaken the heights of heaven, slept with women, defiled yourselves with the daughters of men, taken your wives, made yourselves like the children of the earth, and given birth to giant sons? Though you were immortal, you defiled yourselves with the blood of women, you bore children with blood and camels. You gave birth to flesh and blood like those who are mortal and perishing. The situation is clear, Enoch has before him the commander of the guards. In fact, he is not the only one who mentions these guards, for the prophet Ezekiel also speaks of them in the Bible. They also appear in the Sumerian Babylonian epic of Gilgamesh. As the birth of the giants is evoked. In the Bible, Baruch, a disciple of the prophet Jeremiah, points to the number of giants that existed on earth before the flood. The water exceeded the highest mountains by 15 cubits. Enoch's account clearly shows the irony of the commander. Who would have expected to see the guards intervening in the people's washbasin rather than to see the people becoming his subordinates lawyers? The commander cannot accept that his troop has messed with people who are mortal and perishing, and this infuriates him. He and his subordinates are only seemingly immortal. The shameful depravity of human daughters and subsequent births could jeopardize this reputation. The children born of the loves of his crew will prove to the inhabitants of this planet that they have been deceived and that the visitors whom they considered gods are not immortal at all. We understand the commander's annoyance at the disobedience of the team he had left on Earth on a reconnaissance mission and as a development aid. As he scoured other regions of the solar system with the spacecraft, the guilty lust of the guards stood in the way of the projects of the cosmos engineers. Ugly story for the commander. I urge the reader not to forget the giants born of a breach of discipline. I will further prove that they existed and I will present the imprints which their great paws have left on the roads of prehistory. Before these events, Enoch was hiding. And none of the sons of man knew where he was and what had happened to him. At that time, it was inconceivable that an individual in the flesh and bones, such as Enoch, would suddenly evaporate without a trace. No one would have known where the prophet was if he had not given the key to the mystery himself, Enoch had boarded a spaceship. Here is how astronaut Enoch speaks, I went to heaven. I entered and approached a wall of crystal stones surrounded by tongues of fire, and I began to be frightened. I crossed my tongues of fire and approached a large crystal house. The walls of this house were like a floor covered with crystal stones, and the floor was made of crystal. The ceiling was like the road of stars and lightning, between which were angels and the sky was water. The walls were surrounded by a sea of fire and the doors were on fire. There was another house, bigger than the first one, all the doors were open. 
This house was, in every way, remarkable for its pomp and grandeur. The floor was fiery, the tops were lightning and stars moving in a circle, and the ceiling was a blazing fire. I saw a high throne, all around him was something like the bright sun. Rivers of fire rose from under the throne, and I could not look at them. Her Majesty was seated, on the throne, her garments were brighter than the sun and whiter than snow. There were ten thousand or ten thousand all around, and he did whatever he pleased. And they that dwell by him shall not be removed day nor night, neither shall they depart from him. They took me with them and transported me to a place. I saw the origin of the lights, the storehouses of lightning and thunder, I saw the mouth of all the rivers on earth. And I saw the mouth of the knee, I saw the cornerstone of the earth, I saw the four winds that carry the earth and the firmament. I saw the winds of the sky, the ones that make the disk of the sun and all the stars rotate. I saw the winds that carry the clouds above the earth, I saw the way of the angels. And I saw at the end of the earth the firmament above the earth. I saw a deep abyss with columns of heavenly fire. And I saw from below falling columns of fire that could not be measured in depth or height. Beyond this abyss I saw a place above which there was no firmament. Beneath which there was neither earth nor water. There were no birds, it was a deserted and gloomy world. I saw there seven stars like great mountains on fire. To my question the angel answered. This is the place where heaven and earth end. I traveled until I came to a place where there was nothing. I saw something terrible there. I saw no sky above, no earth below. Nothing but a deserted place. There was a great fire burning. This place had deep cuts and was completely filled with large columns of falling fire. Everything is as clear as can be. Enoch describes exactly a space trip, using comparisons to allow his contemporaries to get an idea of his adventure. Like Ezekiel, he begins by recounting how an auxiliary shuttle took him to the main spaceship. Enoch is astonished and terrified. He does not know the materials from which the spacecraft is made. And so he can do nothing but compare its heat insulating shell with crystalline stones resembling those his contemporaries had seen adorning temples and palaces. Reaction nozzles already on fire were burning like tongues of fire. Constructed from the same material as the outer shell, the interior of the device also seemed to be made of crystal. What Enoch takes as his ceiling is obviously nothing but what he sees through the tambourines, but he does not know what is the insulating glass that allows him to observe the stars. The sea of fire that surrounds the device is produced by the reflection by the hull of the dim light in an atmosphere-free space. In the larger of the two ships, he meets the commander, his majesty. Because everyone is listening to him and no one is above him. The commander's attire seemed brighter than the sun, and whiter than snow. A justified comparison if we consider that Enoch and his countrymen were covered only with rough goat's hair. You have to be blind to lose knowledge, as some commentators do. Of considering this description of a spaceship as a dream or a vision. The prophet recounts how he saw the mouth of all the rivers of the earth. He describes that no man's land where birds do not live, that area of deadly cold where the horizon no longer exists, the place where heaven and earth end. Here is what Enoch says about the frightening face of the cosmos. There my eyes saw the secret of lightning and thunder, the secret of the winds, how they split to beat on the ground, and the secrets of the clouds and why the dew is falling. There I saw where this place goes and how, from there, the dust is impregnated, with water, on the ground. Then all the secrets of lightning and light were revealed to me, as they burst forth into blessings to fill the earth. For thunder has its well-defined laws as to the duration of the noise which commands it. Thunder and lightning are never separated. Animated by spirits, they travel together without parting. For when lightning strikes, his voice and thunder are heard. Enoch has knowledge that will not come into the possession of mankind until thousands of years later. We know that thunder is caused by the sudden expansion of lightning-heated air, and that it propagates at the speed of sound, 343 meters per second. The laws of nature would have been known long before man could have been trained according to the Book of Enoch.
But the leaders of the church rightly feared the overly intelligent readers of the Bible, who might have discovered in it the physical laws that govern the universe. Man could have known for a long time, instead of being forced to believe. When we see the formations of clouds above the earth on television, we understand what Enoch meant when he witnessed this phenomenon from a great distance, we saw the storehouse of lightning. Lightning is a huge electric spark between two piles of clouds with opposite charges, which form discharge channels between them. Only when one of these channels touches the ground or another pile of clouds occurs in the form of lightning, the major discharge with columns of heavenly fire. Until then, it could be said that the lightning had gathered in some warehouses. Enoch had no idea about electricity. After those days, in that place where I saw all the faces of what was hidden, I was taken by a whirlwind and taken to the west. My eyes saw there all the hidden things that must reach the earth, an iron mountain, one of copper, one of silver, one of gold, one of soft metal, and one of lead. The engineer said to me, wait a minute and everything that is hidden will be revealed to you. These mountains, which your eyes have seen, the mountain of iron, the mountain of copper, the mountain of silver, the mountain of gold, the mountain of soft metal, and the mountain of lead, will all be before your chosen one like wax before fire, and like the water that descends from the top of the mountain. This will mean the end, because they will know all the secrets as well as the tonic hidden forces and the forces of all those who practice the charms that melt images in cast iron because they will finally know the art of extracting granite from the dust of the earth and raising soft metal from the earth. Lead and zinc are not extracted from the earth as a raw metal. There is a source that produces them, as Enoch learned at the dawn of time. Today's satellites detect various metal deposits, mountains of iron, copper, gold, and silver, beneath the surface of the earth's crust. Enoch is right when he says that silver is obtained from the dust of the earth. In the accessible part of the Earth's crust, the silver content of the soil is about 0.1 grams per ton. Silver is more commonly found as a byproduct of other metals than in the form of cost-effective deposits with a proportion of about 500 grams per ton. However, it must be extracted from the dust of the Earth. Lead is seldom found in pure form in the Earth's crust. It is obtained by pyroreduction. At a temperature between 1000 and 1200 degrees, the boiling mass then draining from the oven like a spring. The same is true for zinc, which is only about 3 grams per ton in the part of the Earth's crust already explored. Enoch means the initiate in Hebrew. We must admit that during his space trip, astronaut scientists really introduced him to various technologies completely unknown in the time in which they lived. 